So let me get started. Thank you very much, Martin, wherever you are, um, for inviting me. Um, it's delightful to be here. Uh, some people still left. I can't see. There's light in my face. <coughs> And anyway, let, let, me, let me launch into it. Um, I've been given very strict instructions about time, so... Um, oh, this thing, yeah. Um, the, the crisis is well known, but let's rehearse some of the relevant facts. Global urban population is increasing by over a million a week. More than half the planet already lives in cities, expected to hit three quarters by mid-century. Half of these live in slums, and the gap between rich and poor grows ever greater. Default solutions to this metastasis, megacities, sprawl, mass migration, promiscuous location, are all nightmares. Cities too big are ungovernable, alienating, threatening, wasteful, unsustainable. Market-driven, bottom-line, locational choices promote global social disruption and insecurity as jobs chase low wages and our urbanity pursues privilege for the so-called creative class. Finally, the, planets, the planet simply cannot keep up with our rates of consumption and waste. Last year, a million and a half Chinese died from air pollution. A billion people can't get a clean glass of water. Others travel miserable hours to work if they can find it. We all know some version of this grim truth. If everyone had the ecological footprint of the average American, we'd need four planets right now to survive. These are not simply urban problems, but cities are distillation machines. They concentrate. If we architects and urbanists have the equivalent of a Hippocratic oath, it's to keep sight of our fundamental task, creating places that are sustainable, equitable, and beautiful. But how? To begin, um, we must continuously negotiate our role and our relevance. Despite our dreams, we are not the hegemons of the urban and must be wary of the top-down. Real power seldom comes our way, and housemen, Spear or Moses must be renounced as models of practice. The ultimate right to the city and its form belongs to us citizens. Well, this is a nice theory, but a somewhat thornier practice. And I certainly don't mean to suggest that we professionals are invariably subordinate. We lay down vital armatures, create the economic, intellectual, analytical, and physical circumstances for the project of the city, and must do so at a man manageable scale, um, commensurate with the question and the crisis. But that our collaboration is contingent and constantly shifting shouldn't obscure what we do, nor its basis in consent. What's clearly not needed is turf warfare. The useless struggles that have yielded such mongrel disciplines as urban design, landscape urbanism, agricultural urbanism, ecological urbanism, and all these other little hybrid academic monsters. Each of these wannabe practices does mark legitimate discontent with our historic insensitivity to morphological nuance, our cluelessness about the environment, and the real meaning of social life. This anxiety is not new, and we, of course, stand on the shoulders of giants. Whether the completely socialized ecological model of the Chicago School or the efforts to situate the natural sciences in the urban context by pioneers like Patrick Geddes, we've been circling this territory for eons and will continue to do so like the wise moths that we are. But there's an even more dramatic risk, and that is that the city is simply disappearing, um, both formally and discursively. As the actual project of urbanization takes the form of the repetitive construction of massive but commonplace infrastructures, hundreds of identical apartment towers, skyscraper-clotted central business districts, giant highways, airport-free zones, we are impelled to identify the city with another territoriality, the ubiquitous ooze that is the characteristic spatial product of neoliberal multinationalism and its global zoning practices. I want to urgently suggest that these phenomena, including the megacities that aggregate them, 
are precisely not cities. We must hold the line against an excessively formal or operational notion of what constitutes a city. The city is no more than the sum of its organizational and operational infrastructures and insist that the social, indeed the democratic possibilities of urban space are at the core of what distinguishes the idea of the city and its practices. The city scene as ground for participation founds another model with a powerful grip on the urban imaginary, one that's been discussed already at this conference, and that is informality, the dominant urbanism of cities in the so-called developing world. Informality purges planning from the charge of domination by foregrounding citizenship and participation. Can we use its methods in our own planning? The question does locate central issues of urban politics and empowerment, but too often we have a romantic and one-dimensional relationship to these places, whether based on their visual complexity, uh, the cubist compositions tumbling delightfully down the hillsides of Rio or Bogota, or more importantly, on their self-initiation, economic creativity, and tight bonds of necessity. Today's do-it-yourself and tactical urbanisms are attempts to reinvigorate community control and to gain purchase in an environment in which that fucking 1% holds all the cards. How to reconcile the actual misery of squatter settlements with their communal dynamics, technical ingenuity, and open-ended formal invention without ratifying the end product? Our ambition should not be to reproduce Daravi or Soweto as a final state, nor to assume that a permanently, if dynamic, condition of organized squalor is the best we can do for the city. The risks of relativism are too great and the results too, too meager. Um, many of you were at the movie last night and that image has been making uh, uh, the rounds, the Torre David in Caracas. Um, and it's al alternately interpreted as a self-enfranchising utopia or as a kind of J.G. Ballard high-rise nightmare. I think that this spectacle stands in the highly ambiguous place once occupied by the famous walled city of Kowloon, insane in its density, romantically outlaw, a desperate, filthy repost to the shiny, sunlit hygiene of modernist urbanism, as well as a kind of nasty orientalist summa of the libertine degradation of the other. Simple normalization is not the answer. And I'm hardly the first to argue uh, that, that, the, that the answer indeed may not uh, be to draw their inhabitants deeper and deeper into the system a la Hernando de Soto by miring them in credit, bank cards, land titles, and the disabling accoutrements of capital. But it's surely critical that we do something. This begins with recognizing that a purely informal se se sector doesn't actually exist. The lives of those in these settlements are generally a combination of survival strategies that cross between these illusory sectors all the time. In the way people find the, and build housing, receive their educations, earn their livings, take their pleasures. Ananya Roy uh, has pointed out the extremes of the fundamentally informal arrangements used by governments to pattern settlement, to shape economic influence, and to negotiate a wide variety of corruptions. Formality and informality both are conceptual ghettos, taking shape in the imaginary to reinforce and further reify a set of practices that have ever-shifting uses. And it is to these the w that we must look. Whatever advances freedom and comfort and the health of the planet is a tool, is a tactic worth using. One of the questions raised by both the patterns of megacities and of the informal is density. And distributing density is one of our core operations as planners and designers. Today, the question is being revisited under the reshaped sensibility of sustainability. And there's little fundamental disagreement that the suburbs and sprawl are fundamentally unsustainable, and that urban density can promote sociability, efficient infrastructure, environmental benefits, mass public transportation, and a more congenial mix of use. But we must think hard about limits, 
the corollary image paralleling the famously pessimistic multiplying of the planets I just showed is the supposedly liberating claim that all of the world's city dwellers could fit in Texas if the entire state were built to New York densities. It's also been estimated that all of Texas could fit into Manhattan if it were built at the densities of Kowloon. Of course, there is a downside here, um, starting with the fact that if all of us were to move to Texas, Rick Perry and Ted Cruz would rule the world. <clears throat> But density is not an absolute, and many of its current enthusiasts, I believe one of them may have spoken at this conference, um, refuse to unpack its subservience to profit, its capacity for the suppression of variety and difference, its threat to the exercise of local and individual forms of autonomy, um, and its ability to further mystify the relationship of the city to what used to be called nature. New York is, at the moment, stuck in a debate over several of our ex-mayor and unfortunately now current mayor's boldest extractive gambits, including a massive upzoning around Grand Central Station and the erection of what's been called a billionaire's row of empire state scaled condominiums for absentee oligarchs at 57th Street that will cast shadows a mile deep into Central Park on winter afternoons. Air is New York's equivalent of petroleum. Although we have come some way since the foundational doctrine of property rights, of the medieval phrase, quius es solum, eus est usque ad coelum et ad infernos, who owns the soil also owns up to heaven and down to hell, um, but not all that far, and the concept remains the conceptual default for most of our planning. Like the Federal Reserve, the New York City Department of City Planning has as its main activity printing new money in the form of the right to occupy the space above us via zoning largesse. And we all know the dangers of uncontrolled inflation. Um, let me shift gears a bit and trace a brief and polemical outline of the points of intervention um, my own formal practice has been engaged in. Um, one of the bugaboos of the politically correct is the idea of the master plan. Stinking of patriarchy, authoritarianism, insensitivity, and the hubris of every kind of overreach, this territory of expressive inquiry is simply too suspect. We have a tendency to look at representations of new cities and quarters in their all, all at once as a kind of pornography, the gaze that maligns and entraps. For many years, these representations have often come in a protective dystopian wrapper, reinforcing the, the, the idea that the visionary is ipso facto um, evil. Um, I've been teaching urban design uh, for, for quite a long time and I, I often ask my students to make or bring in images of ideal cities. And there was a long and troubling period when a very large percentage of them brought in an image from Blade Runner, um, The Fifth Element or similar. Images of undeniable graphic power but ultimately completely sinister meaning. Um, I think this reflects both the incompetence and bad motives of authority and a kind of negative celebration of popular empowerment. The postmodern critique of totalizing systems of knowing, meaning, acting, and representing was founded in an appreciation of the actual diversity of being and experience, in an embrace of the qualities of the other, and in a re-understanding of the nature of equality. Moving beyond modernity's infatuation with mathematical models of social relations, a more progressive discourse imbibed the theories and the arts of difference, as I suggested earlier today, and looked to re-identify the sources of its own diversity. In my own school days, back in the 1920s, um, uh, this meant the identification of squatters and informality with a more general notion of user control um, that we thought could percolate up and down the spectrum, spectrum of intervention and participation.
It also meant that appreciation of the complex social, economic, and formal ecologies of the historic city became far more appreciated as the basis for both activism and design. I, however, grew up on utopia. And the idea of the new town, conceived in, in its all at once, has always been on my mind. My first architectural model sometime in grade school was of Brasilia. Unable to think of another way of constructing a dome, I used a half grapefruit for the Congress Hall, an obvious, an obvious early example of my commitment to green architecture. Um, I pawed repeatedly through Lewis Mumford's The City in History to get to the plates of Wallingby in Sweden. I spent six months on a kibbutz. Um, my childhood was largely passed in an idyllic modernist suburb of the formidably planned Washington, D.C. I was a volunteer at that great temporary intentional uh, community, Resurrection City. I did miss Woodstock, alas, but was certainly part of the nation of its fellow travel travelers and was simultaneously immersed in the spatial politics of both the out there and the ameliorative. I worked as an advocacy planner and a minor municipal official. I was a squatter in London. I was equally stimulated by Arca Graham and Jane Jacobs and still am. I see no contradiction. Both styles of thinking are deeply relevant and true ecological imagination always suggests expansiveness and inclusion. I'm not trying to take a moderate position here to split the difference. I want to argue that work on the city can begin anywhere where some heart and mind felt certainty is to be found. I believe that neither the dominant deductive style of planning, we begin with a general program, proceed to a morphological frame, and finally get down to the doorknobs, um, uh, neither that nor uh, the more open-ended inductive style start with a memory of a sunny day in Venice or Cartagena or with some other form that insistently insinuates itself into your sketchbook. The process must be dialectical, mutually interrogatory, a framework that applies not simply to questions of scale and direction, but also to styles of participation. Equity demands the most varied and fluid forms of both imagination and representation. I'm going to show you either two or four projects, depending on how the time goes. Um, one from 1994, um, one from 2010, and two others current, we'll see. These occupy different conceptual spaces, but all deal with questions of urban autonomy. In three cases via the creation of brand new cities, the first fantastical, the second and third more conventional, and in the fourth, through the retrofit of an existing one. They're all projects that are represented in a projective all at once, indispensable as stimulus and as propaganda for possibility. Of course, we are effectively creating new cities all the time. China is doing it in the old-fashioned way, finding empty sites, constructing massively, planning a long march of urbanization that will move a quarter of a billion people into towns in the next 10 years. Such accelerated single-form construction um, has been historically typical in the U.S. too, where suburban sprawl uh, and its reformulation as the so-called edge city uh, have created new patterns of movement and distribution of uses, but little change in density, inefficiency, or alienation. However, that the future of the city is unpredictable should not discourage us from speculation about the right now. Too much contingency yields an oppressive uncertainty. Too little simply imprisons us. First project from 1994. It's called Weed, Arizona. Um, Weed is, is a project for the design of a small new city on a, on a small part of an existing military base near Yuma, Arizona. Sited along an artificial lake on the lower Colorado River, Weed embodies a set of motherhood issues that characterize all our work on city design uh, and that are the bedrock of sustainable urbanism. To begin, the town is car-free, vehicles relegated to the periphery with benign means, um, 
walking being the alpha, used for internal circulation. To enable this, the town is strictly bounded, its edges fixed. Its structure is based, as you see here, on a series of neighborhood scaled increments based on a 10-minute walking radius, or 20 minutes from desert edge to water, to water edge, that locates both centers and other distributed facilities and public spaces, a basic unit of accountancy for complete neighborhoods. Beyond that, the organization is, to put it mildly, um, complex and enables, among other things, one of the salient opportunities of the good urban life, which is to say, getting lost. Now, despite their somewhat wild appearance, the drawings for weed are meant to be read as precisely as possible um, and are drawn to scale. The map of differences is authoritative, suggesting both size and variety. Thus, while we don't specify what the meaning of the different shades of blue and green might be, ornamental garden, constructed wetland, picnic ground, swimming hole, fish farm, we do propose a highly particular density of difference. It should be clear that the remix of green, blue, and built spaces represents a fairly radical divergence with contemporary practice dramatically skewed greenish. Um, the architecture may be strange, but it too is also precise. Weed is imagined as a loft based on a kind of architectural stem cell, space without assigned use, but ready to assume any. This is not exactly far-fetched. Not simply has the discourse of flexibility and what we used to call equipotentiality um, been a staple of late modernist fantasies about architecture, the experience of the post-industrial city, as well as the informal one, um, have shown increasing possibilities for a flexible, dramatically mixed distribution of uses, as well as for the imperatives of reuse. The discourse of the loft that arose in the 60s and 70s was a collusion of two distinct, if related, streams. The first was the more ideologically driven idea of flexibility that found its most dramatic expression in buildings like the Pompidou Center, where the animating fantasy was one of subdivision, the idea that from a very large and essentially undefined space with services nearby, a variety of more customized environments could be carved out. This essentially paralleled the discovery of loft living in abandoned urban industrial zones, um, most classically Soho in New York, where the occupation of former factories became a kind of um, ideal type for the artistic life, rich with implications of freedom, abundance, and the recovery of the righteous vibe of a vanished industrial class. In both cases, architectures that appeared flexible proved rigid and far less tractable than they'd been touted. In the case of enormous buildings like the Beauborg, not to mention the giant floor-plated office buildings still typical of corporate America, the very vastness of the space and the long distances to its daylit perimeter were efficient only according to a soulless bureaucratic model. Likewise, the much smaller lofts of Soho were constrained by the limitations of their original construction. Party wall buildings with decent light at one end and not much more than an air shaft at the other, they worked well unsubdivided, but failed when their action painter inhabitants spawned offspring and required private spaces, extremely difficult to provide with adequate light and air. Weed, for its part, investigates an idea about lofts that do not find differentiation via subdivision, rather through aggregation. The notion is that spaces could be more particular, more individual, if the medium from which they are produced is not overwhelmingly simple, um, but more complex, more resistant, uh, and yielding variegated spaces and provoking unexpected opportunities. But these spaces of unspecified use but open potential can be designed with precise characteristics. One of the arguments of the project is that architecture and the city find their basic forms and sizes in relationship to the fundamental needs of the human body and of sustainability. The range of human dimensions and their environmental requirements are not obscure. We conduct our activities face to face and our spatial needs and habits of both conjunction and isolation have been developed down the millennia. Buildings designed for daylight and cross-ventilation, 
the bedrock of sustainable architecture, not so well observed in this room, um, will fall within a narrow range of lengths and widths, and the drawings for weeds speculate about a number of configurations for flexible and sustainable, yet resistant and complex forms of inhabitation. This embraces both plan and section. In a city organized around the primacy of human locomotion, buildings will tend, as they were from the dawn of architecture to the end of the 19th century, they will tend to be low and accessible by foot power. In general, this means a default maximum of around five or six stories. Having spent 26 years living on the top floor uh, of a five-story walk-up building, I can verify that extensive empirical research um, reveals that this is pretty much the upper limit um, for the regular climbing of stairs um, by middle-aged Americans at any rate. The body-based sustainable city will thus tend to be both dense and low. Um, so much about the fundamental physical requirements of such a city is easily derived. It's possible to offer a very wide variety of solutions to its design based simply on common sense, a logic that simultaneously tests form, use, and respiration. Of course, the city will always abound with special uses, and Weed has, as you see here, a zone of theaters and entertainment, areas where buildings of larger dimensions are integrated with a texture of smaller structures. And this compatibility of sizes is certainly one of the key issues uh, of the morphological research to be conducted for our cities in general nowadays. Um, and these cities must also have a variety of centers at different scales and of different characters. Although the forms may be somewhat eccentric, many of these places are designed recollectively as all architecture must mix memory and invention and evoke in proportion, dimension, materiality, or feeling some touchstone for successful placemaking and fix the system of taste and of their authors. Um, what you, while you may not precisely feel the souks of Fez, the Piazza Navona, uh, or the canals of Suzhou, they've registered indelibly on me as places of pleasure, practicality, and harmony. Urbanism's aspiration must always also be spatial, um, whatever other contingencies it seeks to satisfy. Still, the notion that a city can be designed in some detail without precise programming and zoning is something we continue to investigate. Zoning, of course, is an artifact of the 19th century, a product of the rise of the industrial city. Um, Although cities have always been zoned in the isolation of royal or sacred quarters or the communal flourishing of the districts of guilds or crafts, the creation of enormous classes of activities and people considered obnoxious is a result of the e ecology of industrial capitalism. Smoke belching factories, fatal rail lines, and restive concentrations of the working class had to be managed spatially for both efficient production and policing. Our cities remain slaves of these tactics and their specific architectures, infrastructures, and social and spatial relations. Weed, like much of our work, investigates the morphological implications of a newly liberated situation, one in which zoning has lost its primary rationale. The twin imperatives of keeping foul uses and dangerous classes in isolation are now undercut by the prospect of clean production, service-oriented urban economies, tolerance for the presence of the other, and a recognition of the decisive role cities play in planetary ecology. However, while this post-industrial condition has enormously reduced the need for maniacal differentiation uh, and undergirds the idea of the loft city, the idea of stem space must be understood critically. Uh, let's go back. Um, as a concept with a real downside risk, a potential threat to local and individual identity. Thinking about the many new ecological cities we must build, not to mention the retrofit of existing ones, we're challenged to find the sources of their particularity. Rejecting both the global branding strategies of corporate urbanism and the twee nostalgia of an architecture and urbanism that continues to insist that culture abides eternally uninflected in historic forms, we must look for fresh combinations that yield new particulars. Obviously, 
Basically, this begins with living cultures and habits, vital connections between urban form and lives led differently, whether in Savannah, Santiago, Shanghai, or Prague. Ecological cities will be irresistibly shaped by the specifics of their bioclimatic and topographical situations, refusing the still dominant paradigm of sealed, uniform, space capsule architecture predicated on a fundamentally paranoid reading of the environment as the source of discomfort and toxic dread, whether from Al-Qaeda, Ebola, MERS, ISIS, or the breeze wafting in from the next Fukushima or Chernobyl. Weed is also an argument for another source of particularity, artistic invention. As local cultures find themselves under increasing duress, originalities of vision must play an increasingly important role. This doesn't mean that every city must be crazy, but it does suggest an unusually liberated situation and that the relationship between freshness and consent is open to new and numerous approaches. This is utopian in that it imagines, it imagines both new forms of architecture and urbanism and fresh forms of linkage between building and civic cooperation. But it's also insistently not so. It does not seek to universalize its architecture, to idealize human subjectivity, or to create, as architects and not merely modernists have long tended to do, a one-size-fits-all form of inhabitation and settlement. One weed might very well be delightful. A world of them would be a nightmare. Um, and now I skip the series of cities we have designed in China. These are real cities, real clients, real country. Uh, I only refer to the eight harmonies, um, which I will return to in the final section of my lecture um, when I get to it shortly. These are two cities that we designed in the orbit of Wuhan, um, one for 400,000, one much smaller. Um, and as you can see, you know, a certain amount of imaginative freedom is possible, although those are hideous representations of imaginary buildings. Uh, but I think some of the spirit of weed lives on in these forms um, and in the idea in particular of a, a kind of um, uh, harmonious relationship between um, the city and water. Um, I've long believed, as my, just my friend Barbara, that hydrology is destiny. Uh, okay. Oh, the final project. And don't stop me until I'm done. This is a project called New York City Steady State. So for the past almost 10 years, Terraform, um, the nonprofit research center I, I founded and direct, has been engaged in a kind of thought experiment. Um, New York City Steady State is an alternative master plan that investigates exactly how autonomous the city might become to see how close to coterminous we can make its ecological footprint and its political boundaries. The idea for this formed a dozen or so years uh, ago when I was teaching a seminar in urban sustainability. We began with exercises using the famous ecological footprint to clarify the metrics of urban respiration and reach and the class took measurements um, both of its own ecological footprints and of various activities and phenomena in the city. This always yielded striking results, and students were suitably abashed at how much of the planet's surface was necessary to produce a Big Mac, a pair of jeans, light in the studio, or a ride to the beach. Um, while this was usefully provocative, it wasn't su sufficiently specific, and we began to look at the actual inputs and outputs of these processes. This literalization via mapping, tabulation, and extrapolation of the real nature and sites of production and consumption gave rise to a broader question. What would it mean to literally take responsibility for all the elements required to sustain us, not as an abstraction like the ecological footprint, but as a fact of actual daily life? What would it mean to actualize the model of import substitution, beloved of developing world economies in the 1950s as well as Jane Jacobs, to think about the city um, 
as a, as a bounded system fully obliged to take complete care of itself. This fantasy was resonant both as a model of sustainability and as a proposition about local collective autonomy. So the basis, the predicate of New York City steady state became the test of complete self-sufficiency. By pushing to the maximum, we elevated the idea of the independent city as an increment of organization and resistance in a globalizing and indifferent system and as a so source of both architectural form and social practice. We've now completed enough work to demonstrate, among other things, that it's possible to feed the current population of about 8.5 million of the city of New York a nutritionally sound diet with food grown entirely within the boundaries of the city. However, the environmental, economic, political, cultural, culinary, and morphological arguments for doing this um, are complex and often uh, defy practicality. While our study is infused with a romantic utopian aroma, it is also a well-calibrated instrument for testing the modes and efficiencies of environmental autom autonomy at many sites and sizes. Small is not necessarily beautiful. There can be economies of scale, and we're not unconscious of various forms of comparative advantage. But societies and economies are always bounded. And New York City Steady State examines the fantasy of autarky um, and a series of logics of the local. We look to an idea about cost-benefit in the environment that's not based on purely economic arguments, not on the algorithms of capitalist realism. For example, the question of food miles is often, uh, whoa, um, is often reflexively understood as a metric in defense not simply of localism, but of a minimized carbon footprint. Um, however, um, a giant cargo ship of containerized apples slowly sailing from New Zealand has a far smaller footprint per apple than a fleet of aging pickup trucks conveying hand-hewn wooden crates of Jana Golds from upstate New York to that food co-op in Bushwick. Um, but fresh, hand-grown apples have other advantages which are irreducible to carbon. So our research is organized by respiratory function, those eight harmonies again, and deal with food, water, air, climate, waste, manufacture, energy, movement, and building. Each of these has strong economic, social, and political implications, and their very porous boundaries uh, create complex interactions with the others. We began with a focus on food. Urban agriculture is a subject of much discussion these days, and obviously it's fundamental to our survival. And it has a, a, the added appeal of a certain challenging um, improbability in the context of a densely built city like New York. So we're now almost done with this volume, and we'll publish it by the end of the year, and have demonstrated that from a purely spatial standpoint, it's possible to produce enough food for all of our people uh, and offer them at least 2,000 nutritious calories each day within the city. Um, our work has investigated sites for production at every scale, including buildings, um, transformed streets, repurposed infrastructure, existing open spaces, and of course, vertical farms. This latter type, um, constructed in their thousands, would be indispensable to full self-sufficiency. However, such vertical systems, um, the sine qua non of maxed out urban agriculture, um, require enormous investment, recast the skyline, are incapable of producing many foods in appropriate quantities, and can be radically impractical. The primary impediment to a genuinely sustainable system of vertical ag agriculture turns out to be um, not space, but the unbelievably high energy inputs needed for illumination and heating, as well as for the massive initial construction, including energy embodied in the materials. Although enough 30-story agricultural towers like this one, using advanced hydroponic, aeroponic, and other minimalist cultivation uh, techniques um, could be built to supply the city with food, um, several steps in quality and freshness, freshness above um, soil and green, 
Anybody old enough to remember that movie? Um, on about 2% of New York's total land area, a photovoltaic array sufficient to supply them would require an area almost four times the total surface area of the city, um, somewhere between 750,000 and, and uh, 1 million acres. Um, alternatively, um, we calculated that 28 nuclear power plants um, would do the job, um, but this struck us as being somehow slightly contrary to the spirit of the exercise. <clears throat> um, so recognizing the impracticality of this arrangement, we've examined a series of sweet spots um, that are more aligned with closing neighborhood scaled loops that utilize viable amounts of energy, reasonable construction investment and available land, and uh, always honor the right to remain of existing people and communities. We've investigated a variety of morphological transformations at every scale that would characterize a city committed to autonomy and the idea that urban respiration must begin locally. One of the speculations that we've pursued is what we're calling the figure ground switch in which the 19th century block pattern sees its built mass migrate into the space of the street, freeing up the interiors of the block for agriculture and other public uses. Now, in its first um, abstract iteration from, from some years ago, um, this inversion was largely directed to questions of movement and of the public realm, to strategies for reconfiguring the ratio of public to private space in the city. Um, we've been looking, we, we, we'd been looking for an outcome that would combine the modernist fantasy of living in a tower uh, in the greenery, no, not so bad, um, with a more historic idea of the central importance of the street. So the interior of the block in our scheme looks like this, and just on the other side of the building it would look like that. Um, this new pattern is one in which urban circulation um, has been radically transformed with streets largely removed from the realm of the automobile um, and to a degree um, from any form of circulation with a mix of um, pedestrians, bikes, trams, buses and relatively few small, slow, um, non-emitting vehicles, something like um, what, what, what are called complete streets. These were imagined as at once post-automotive and pre-modern, and a particular inspiration was the, both the medieval and the Islamic city. Now, when we first tried this maneuver, we saw it much too simply. In that initial sketch of a pure figure ground switch, the morphology is attractive, but the real potential for intensive food production is very small. We'd simply plunged in, devoting too little time to the actual metrics of sufficiency, the relationship of the new morphologies to the needs and numbers of existing populations, and to the production of truly useful amounts of food. We soon realized that even if we devoted all of the new terraced rooftops and interior courts to agriculture, the harvest was insufficient to feed more than about 3% of the encompassed population. So we launched a more precise uh, investigation of several, several blocks in Sunnyside, Queens, um, which revealed to us fairly graphically um, the dilemma. So we began to look at the transformation with a basic assumption. As I said before, the population of the blocks under study must remain constant and the area of calculation would not exceed the dimensions of the streets and blocks under consideration. So we began by testing this 100% scheme. And I think the result has a simulating, somewhat Kowloon-like urban flavor. The densities in architectural relationships in section and the contrast between the narrowed streets and the expansive interiors is great. But the vertical farms, the cylindrical things here, um, present their usual problems. The density of the towers compromises efficient solar access, um, especially at the lower levels. Um, this does not preclude food production on these floors, but means that energy inputs are substantially increased. Add another nuclear power plant. One solution is to employ the lower portions of the towers for other uses, perhaps wine storage or mushroom growing. Um, another is to have fewer towers. Um, both of these reduce on-site capacity to grow food. So we finally found our sweet spot at about 30% of the food requirement on site, which I think yielded a somewhat more gracious proposition.
The nature then of the steady state economy reveals itself in these calculations. I'm getting to the end. Adding residential units to the site means that housing can be subtracted elsewhere in the city, which is useful in reconsidering parts of New York that are built at suburban densities and still entirely dependent on cars. Energy isn't exactly fungible. It's tied to the site of its thermodynamic conversion, whether in a car, an air conditioner, or a light bulb. Using additional energy to up food production has implications for citywide conservation and production strategies. And if most of the food is coming from off-site, this ramifies in bigger strategies for provisioning the city as a whole. In the Queen's case, the switched blocks that I show you are adjacent to one of the very large vertical farm complexes. Vienna, take note. This is above a, a vast rail yard, um, not abandoned, but existing underneath a deck, um, which is near enough to be part of any local aggregation and disaggregation scheme. In the same spirit, this same area might be used for solar arrays to power the vertical farms or simply to plug into the increasingly autonomous autonomous city electrical grid. So we've now looked at many specific architectures and solutions and have designed uh, prototype vertical farms for both crop and animal production, various smaller scale greenhouses, wall systems, uh, and other elements of what is now a fairly well-developed repertoire of agrarian resources. We've looked at the way uh, these structures and techniques can be integrated into the fabric of the city and have been particularly interested in the reclaiming of the space of the street from an automobile-dominated culture uh, for a broader mix of public uses, in including such immobile examples as agriculture. As I say, we've looked at all scales from window boxes to skyscrapers in order to suggest a system in which production is not monopolized by the urban equivalent of agribusiness, um, which is something this whole project implicitly critiques, um, and we're, we're perfectly aware of how tempting a target millions of square feet of municipally developed automated vertical farms would be um, for such sinister enterprises as Archer, Archer Daniels Midland or Monsanto. Last page. We've also investigated scenarios for reconfiguring the city as a whole to allow it to grow 100% of its food supply, um, which is part of our primary interest in teasing out um, what will be genuinely new in the organization of radically sustainable cities uh, around the world. The main means of production for us include large areas of vertical farms, particularly in portions of the city that are currently built at suburban densities, um, figure ground switches, overbuilding of highway and rail infrastructures, uh, in intensive utilization of rooftops, vacant lots, brownfields, and other available spaces. However, our larger reimagining of the city is based primarily on an intensification of neighborhood autonomy. Our objective is to scale self-reliance down whenever possible, and a strong preference for local accountability in all aspects of urban um, respiration from energy to sewage. Um, our drawings of the whole of New York reorganized um, are diagrammatic. Um, we don't actually imagine a literal um, circular morphology for these transformed neighborhoods. But we do intend that neighborhoods be recalibrated on the basis of walk time. And we do envision the emergence of a kind of green supergrid as a zone of circulation, agriculture, climate control, recreation, water management, and social organization. We're also in the process of designing a repurposed subway system to facilitate not simply the movement of people, but of goods. But we're also looking at, um, as I say, large-scale sweet spots and have studied a scheme for 30% production within the city as a whole for a 100-mile uh, self-sufficient agricultural radius um, and a system for uh, a statewide uh, self-reliance um, that would um, utilize uh, the this great 19th century piece of infrastructure, the Erie Canal that travels 400 miles uh, across New York State. Um, as I said before, we anticipate that we'll complete this study within five years inshallah, uh, and that we'll be able to demonstrate the very high degree to which it's possible to radically elevate the autonomy of the city.
The encyclopedia of technologies and morphologies that are emerging from this work are meant to offer a practical lexicon for the global transformation of cities and the broader assumptions of urban culture about the nature of human autonomy that must increasingly characterize a planet that is alert to its limits and move to deal both with distributive justice and with our very survival. <laughs>